The Hawks, Cats and Dockers, all big winners. The Tigers get back on track and the Mad Jack Man puts on a show. On the panel, Lee Matthews, Jude Bolton and Mark McVeigh. His younger brother, Jared, joins us, as does Kangaroo skipper Andrew Swallow. Steve-O's got some big news on the Ds and Lethal tells us about the rule he wants to change. Let's get it started. And away we go to get things started. Oh, the crowd and we're into it. This will be a lifter. It goes bang. Looks through it and gets it. Allardyne's got it. Everybody and welcome to Game Day. I'm Hamish McLaughlin. Thank you for joining us. Hope every mother watching is having a great Mother's Day. To my mother, Syl, and to the mother of my child, so happy Mother's Day on a personal note. Highlights everywhere this weekend. Round 7 action started with an absolute thriller on Friday night and was the grand final rematch last night. man that played in it is a panel member. Welcome to the Premiership Swan, Jude Bolton. Welcome, Jude. Thank you, Hamish. Cheers, mate. I think uh, we all found out that uh, the Hawks are pretty well placed after playing all the top eight sides last uh, last night. So uh, yeah, they're six and one now and going well. Hawks were sensational last night, as were the Cats on Friday night against the Bombers. A former Bomber, Mark McVay, welcome to you, Spike. Hi, mate. Yeah, it was a fantastic uh, game, and uh, Geelong just showed why they are such a great club. And uh, Essendon still did well; had 30 shots on goal, so uh, they were right in the game. Just didn't take their opportunities, but uh, really interesting game to watch. And arguably the greatest individual ever to pull on boots. Lee Matthews, welcome to you, Lee. I was just thinking, despite the two blockbuster games Friday and Saturday, I had the pleasure yesterday afternoon to see Magic Door. Now, he is the latest in the awesome, freakish physical specimens that would Nat and Yui, the Franklin, she's going to give us some thrills. He's sculpted, isn't Unbelievable. he? Unbelievable. Looks like he's been created by NASA to he's play good, 500 games. He's good games. just to watch before yeah. he even starts playing footy. But he had a breakout <laughs> game yesterday. I mean, he played really well. So, gee, he was exciting to watch. Six goals, four yesterday for Magic Door. Let's go to the results. Friday night football, Geelong Cats, seven zips. They never yeah. cease to amaze. Yeah. Richmond by 41, never headed by Port at Amy. West Coast Eagles, tight, but they kicked away 26-point winners. North Melbourne, Andrew Swallow in today. That was tight too. 54-point winners, though, in the end. Welcome to the Magic Show. Yeah. Hawthorne, uh, they were unswan like Sydney. Hawks, brilliant. And Fremantle, certainties. Then no chance. Then 27 point winners. Let's look at the Steel Blue. Uh, no, not the common. The Steel Blue ladder. Uh, Geelong Cats, 7 zip. They just continue to get the job done. Essendon, 6 and 1, as are the Hawks. Uh, Hawks only lost to the top of the table. Cats, Port Adelaide from 5 zip to 5 2. Swans, 5 2, as are Frio. They've won their last three. Richmond in the eight. Collingwood in eighth spot. The Blues, they can jump back in with a big win over the Ds this afternoon. Crows have got the Giants. And Melbourne, uh, they've got the Blues this afternoon. Remember, it's Monday night football as well tomorrow night, where it is the Blues and St Kilda. Lindsay Thomas, a couple yesterday, leads the Coleman. Jack Revolt, five goals, one. Josh Kennedy in the wet. Jude Bolton really impressed with his game. Travis Cloak got the bagel yesterday afternoon. But uh, in the end... It was the grand final rematch that we all were looking forward to as well as Friday night football and the Swans disappointing but if you have a look at recent history between the grand final sides, four of the last six outings, the side that loses the grand final wins the next match. That is little consolation for those that lost in the grand final but Jude, they're the facts. They are, yeah. They just uh, they came out with just an intensity and a, a willingness to work for each other, and, and certainly uh, they jumped us from the start. And it was it was hard to arrest that momentum from now. Talking about momentum, the Pies had all the momentum, but uh, Fremantle got home by 27 points in the end. We said they've won their last three. They're now five and two. At the end of the match, they dished out uh, instead of football uh, footballs to the crowd or caps. Uh, Flowers oh, to the mothers, but yes. Lethal, it was an important win, and they looked dead and buried at three quarter time. Amazing. Well, it's more, yeah, well, that's true. Collingwood had actually got back on terms after being a long way behind early, but just with a couple of players that there, we know Pavlich is out for a while, we know Bradley's out for a while. They lost Hill, he's back yesterday, but five still out, and they've, they've gone, to, uh, gone to Queensland, beating the Suns, and then 
held on against uh, against Collins. So they've done a magnificent job with a fairly depleted team the last couple of weeks. Spike, we got on the plane yesterday in Adelaide and everyone was saying tight at uh, Eddie Head. We got off the plane and everyone was talking about the Magic show. Yeah, quite amazing, isn't it, to see uh, the development of him. He's been outstanding. And some of the marks he took uh, deep forward, which is where he's really dangerous. Uh, not only can he mark, but... Uh his ruck work is uh, really developing as well around that forward 50 and uh, he's enjoying his footy. Real hard matchup, and uh, it's great to see someone of his background and what he's been able to do playing big football. Early days. Him and Natanui, who's you know about three or four years into his career, more than that. But how do you see, can he be another Natanui or oh, absolutely. better he, in he some puts, areas? He puts some space on uh, his opponent straight away, doesn't mm. he? His long strides, gets out there strong and yeah, imposing figure. From the Roos uh, to the Cats and perhaps the Lions, the greatest team of all, that's the opening line of the Geelong team song. Since 07, 125 of the last 150 they've won. They've won three premierships at a staggering 82% winning rate. Compare that to the Lions under Letha, who were simply stunning. Three premierships at slightly less. It is a phenomenal run, and Lethal, they continue to blood these youngsters yeah. who just fit in. Unbelievable. I think the competition has just deteriorated a little when we went from 16 teams to 18 teams. Like, Geelong have had a better seven years than the, the Lions had, but the Lions team of 202-203 would eat that Geelong team of Friday night. Lions best of Not all. necessarily the Geelong team of 2009, but I don't think Geelong as good as they were three or four years ago, but they still might be as good, if not better, than anyone else. So just just young, is it. that just because of the young players, Lee? Or? Well, like, yeah, I mean, they've got half a team that are under 50 games. They had, they had, on Friday night, I'm talking, they had five players who hadn't played 10 games. I mean, I know the young players are doing all right, but I think that's a bit indicative of just how good the best teams are just at this last year or so. The best team of last year on uh, Grand Final Day were the Swans. They might have a problem with Adam Goods, though. <laughs> Spike and uh, Lee, Spike Lee, you're in charge actually yeah, I, of I'm, this. I'm of the opinion that Goodsy tried to keep his feet. We know the sliding rule. We're trying to encourage players to attack the ball. This one's completely different. That was the uh, one last year that he got rubbed out for. Uh, completely different action. He actually slid in there, but I thought last night he tried to keep his feet. We know the rule says that mu players must come mm. to the contest, bend down and pick it up. He tried to stick his foot out and uh, toe the ball along, and it didn't work out. I don't think there's much to it. I think Goodsy will be fine. OK, Leith, we'll have a look at these. This is Ashley Smith on Tommy Rockliffe up at the Gabba yesterday and others to follow. See, see, the total adjudication on this was their high contact made. If the contact is made to Rockliffe's head, then the player who chooses to bump is in trouble. But I yeah, watch it two or three times. You almost need to forensically freeze frame it to see. Same as that one there. Was there contact made to McGlynn's head? And that's what the match review panel have to adjudicate. It probably looks like there was, so... Most probably the, uh, the player who chose to bump in that circumstance. That was Taylor Dray. Mm. What a similar on Friday night. Exactly the same. I mean, I've watched this about six times now, and I still am certain whether it was body to body contact, which is allowed, but if, if Brendan Goddard's head was contacted by any part, well, apart, apart from his head, that's different, not a head, head clash, let's put that out. It was certainly a good old fashioned uh, shirt front as uh, Brendan Goddard. Uh, I love this guy. Uh, yeah. Hashtag fair game, yeah. play on. Next, yeah. next memory time. banks to the stuff. That's, <laughs> that's that brilliant. Is terrific. And you know what? Let's not take that out of a game. That is sensational to watch that stuff. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's, that's two players going at the ball now. It wasn't an overly hard hit. No, no, we've got to be careful. What I would argue is no. You can't one, say too much. One player, is, <laughs> one, one player is going at his opponent. The, the opponent doesn't see him coming. Yeah, I understand. That's why there is this duty of care, as we call it, mm. and therefore the high contact gets penalised. And Spike, just a correction, first year at seven, eight premierships on a statue, you can say whatever he wants. <laughs> yeah, no, no, we debate, we debate, we debate. I'm yeah. talking about what he did in this. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Mark Stevens yeah. caught up with the Melbourne uh, interim CEO, Peter Jackson, during the week, and, uh, well, it wasn't glowing. The structure is a little bit too um, disparate in, in the sense that there's <clears throat> three or four reporting lines that come up to the CEO, and, I, you know, in a sense, you might say that the CEO, therefore, is running the footy department. I don't think it can work that way. CEOs aren't paid, in my opinion, to run football departments. Pretty clear, Lethal, well, that uh, I mean, it's the org structure was wrong. Well, what you're talking about now is footy clubs in about a decade have gone from being a small business. I mean, our footy department, the Lions in early 2000s, could meet round a table. There's like seven or eight of you. Now your footy department's maybe 40 people. Mm -hmm. So therefore, when you get into the administration of the club, clearly the CEO runs the club, but the, there's a head of the footy department who actually oversees the footy department. But everyone, the point of all this is everybody's in it together. 
So you don't actually have different departments that just don't talk to each other. It's just a kind of, as Peter Jackson is talking about, the line of uh, the chain of command. OK, a lot more from Peter Jackson when Mark Stevens joins us. A lot of magic door as well. So much to get through. Up next, Andrew Swallow. He was terrific yesterday. The Kangaroos, they got away to a big win. He saw magic firsthand. I know a lot of people would say 21 is really young to get married, but for Andrew and I, it worked well in terms of moving into state. the little angel that came down Perfect palm down, Swallow takes off. That's out of the copy book. Welcome back to game day, captain of the Kangaroos. Unbelievably good play, Andrew Swallow. Welcome to you, Andrew. Thank you. How often do you sit at home and just watch highlights of yourself? <laughs> not too, uh, too often. There's not too many highlights of me running and kicking goals, so most of them are getting clearances, and uh, yeah, they're probably not the prettiest things to watch. A low light yesterday. Uh, we thought for the Kangaroos fans, but you've just walked in, not limping. We'll just show you what happened with Liam Pickin. Tell us, how is the right knee? Oh. Yeah, it's um, it's not too bad. It, um, you know, it's a little bit sore, but um, I don't think there's any major structural damage. You have to go and get scans tomorrow, but um, yeah, hopefully it will it will pull up all right. But we'll we'll sort of know later in the week. We all look at that, Andrew, and hopefully you may have got out. But you were that close to 12 months out of footy, weren't you? When you kind of. Just a fine line. Yeah, like initially when I did it, I thought, oh, geez, I might be in some trouble. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, we do a lot of work on um, injury prevention stuff. We probably spend more time in the gym doing that than actual weights. So, you know, the, uh, the physios and, and our um, weights coach are sitting there pretty uh, happy with themselves. Just paid for itself then. Yeah. yeah. Andrew, your form in recent years has been remarkably good. Three best and fairest. Tell us, where does 2013 sit? The numbers suggest disposals, clearances and contested possessions you're having your best year of your career? Um, oh, yeah, it's always always hard to say. It's only early on. Um, but, yeah, I've been, been able to find the footy uh, a bit more this year. I'm um, starting to get a few few harder tags. So, sort of working through that. But, you know, I think what's helping me is we're starting to get, you know, guys like Jack Siebel, Ryan Bastanak. Um, you know, these guys are starting to play some, some really good footy and, and take the load off. We had a, a Boomer Harvey for the first six rounds. So, um, you know, the younger guys taking the pressure off, um, you know, Boomer and Wellesley and, and Drewy. Lethal, the, uh, the Roos have strung a couple together now. Yesterday you were there at Etihad. It was tight throughout. We jumped on the plane in Adelaide and we thought it was going to go down to the wire. A 54-point win to the Kangaroos and the water room chatter this week will be around Majak 6. Mm. But it was a good game of footy. I mean, if you like scoring. And there were 63 uh, scoring shots. And really the, the story uh, in the first part of the game was almost every time the Bulldogs went forward they kicked a goal the kangaroos were getting as many shots but were a little bit inaccurate so that kept the game uh, the game Sarah Kowski come across from Hawthorne well, that, that that kept the game tied but the Bulldogs were kicking a goal about every third time they went forward so just that forward efficiency was uh, was keeping them on the score this is as good as you'll see wasn't it uh, poor old McMillan he's on uh, he's on Roy, uh, Robert Murphy's back but going left turning right that that was a fantastic individual goal and I like I like Liam Jones yesterday I've always wondered about him as a player but he's now starting to attack the footy in the air this was indicative of the kangaroos now that, that goal was kicked but they were having a lot of shots from the 50 meter line and kicking a lot of long behind so but uh, I guess uh, this was just happened to be gold thrown in the wrong spot you spoil long down the center corridor off the out of the defensive goal square you might get scored against Lindsay Todd was always dangerous, a little bit inaccurate yesterday, but again, he had a lot of shots from, uh, from quite uh, acute angles. So eventually, nine goals in the last quarter, the Kangaroos, Kangaroos ran away with the game. The Roos actually leaked too many goals. That was the worry for them. They kicked 15 goals, the Bulldogs out of 44 entries. The Bulldogs, to me, looked really dependent on Ryan Griffin because when he was getting the ball in space, he was good. Well, and we said earlier, the Magic show was open. It's not going to be open every week. Because I don't think he knows what he's do, what, why he's doing what he's doing. But when the ball falls for him, a couple of times the ball was 15 metres away from him and he took about four, three steps and he got there. He doesn't look like he's moving quick because 
someone says, like Black Caviar, the racehorse, he takes such a long stride compared to the other racehorses, which is what was that, that particular horse. And he is just an amazing athlete. So, again, I don't, I don't, he's going to have some ordinary days, I reckon. But yesterday, he just showed what if, you, if you've got those kind of physical talents and the ball falls for you, just so exciting to watch. And great to have on your team, I would have thought, as a young player playing his fourth game, uh, Andrew. Yeah, it's exciting. Magic's been you know, on a list for um, three years, four, into his fourth year now. So he's been there a while, and, and to see him and, and the development he's, he's taken has, has been amazing. And yeah, you know, as you said, he's going to have some, some days where, where he, um, he doesn't get a kick, but he was terrific on the weekend. And um, you know, a lot of that's got to go down to the other forwards as well. I thought mm. Aaron Black um, you know, played a really good game as well, and, and Drew Petrie. So if we can get the three of them working in really well, um, you know, it's going to enable um, Magic to get his opponent one out. You spoke about Boomer Harvey. I mean, he's obviously been itching to get back in. How did he go last night? Yeah, I thought he was terrific. He had, a, you know, tough to come back against the Bulldogs and, and have a hard tag. Pick you know, with straight, on him. straight onto him. So, <laughs> you know, but I, I thought the way he he just gives us a bit more class and a bit more polish. And um, you know, to see um, him and you know, I think he probably hit up uh, Drew Petrie two or three times. And he just has that. Just that knack with you know playing sort of 12, 13 years with him, he just knows what they're going to do, and and yeah, it was great to have him back, and you know I really thought he, he broke open that game in the, the second half. And tell us, so early in the game, I mean Daniel Wells was sub. I mean we all thought, why is that? Why was that? <laughs> oh, it's just a load management. So okay. you know Wells, he's had a, a delayed pre-season. Um, he's had Achilles problems, and it was either that or he misses the game. So okay. um, you know it, it's. You don't always want to be a sub, but I suppose in this, this, um, you know, we, it worked to our benefit in this uh, this game. Mm. Lethal, you mentioned Ryan Griffin. He was good yesterday. Yeah, he was good. Yeah, no, he was. Uh, Jack Zubel was really good for. It was interesting. Jack Zubel looked like as much as he is as a matchup around the middle. He was the matchup for Griffin. I mean, they weren't playing. This is playing the same position. They weren't playing on each other. And Jack Zub was really good for the Kangaroos, and Griffin was really good for the for the Bulldogs. But he's like a penetrating midfielder. If he gets his thirty odd touches, because he runs and carries the ball and kicks the ball really long, he, he's really, uh, you know, really. Uh, but they they're very dependent on him, Cooney a bit, but certainly the Bulldogs very dependent on Griffin. So North Melbourne, they win their third of the year. They're three and four after seven. Uh, still a come on game day. Simon Marshall's Mother's Day tribute flashback. At Sunday and Monday football on seven. to catch up with Andrew Swallow's beautiful wife, Elise, to find out why she deserves some pampering. Hello. Hello. <laughs> How are you? Very well, thank you. Busy? Yes, very busy. I've been a speech pathologist for four years, and this year I've started my own business. So I've been working very hard, and I'm looking forward to a morning off. You guys were married at 21. How is married life now? I know a lot of people would say 21 is really young to get married, but for Andrew and I, it worked well in terms of moving into state and getting to spend every day with my best friend and someone who I have the most fun with and get to wake up next to every morning, it's such a blessing, so I love it. It must have been exciting when Andrew was named captain. Yeah, it was really exciting. We went out and had a bottle of champagne to celebrate. And... Cheers, cheers. Rachel Finch with Elise Swallow. Andrew, you've got no kids. You're one of four boys, aren't you? Yeah, one of four boys. So If you're clever now, you can get ahead of David and the others in wishing <laughs> your mother a happy Mother's Day. Yeah, yeah well, happy Mother's Day uh, to Alice. So she's, uh, she's actually overseas at the moment, so having a bit of a holiday. Um, but, uh, yeah, I'll get in, in before the other boys. She'll be watching online, I'm sure. Tell me, uh, <laughs> David, your brother, number one draft pick, how often do you guys speak and talk about the game and your form, his form? Um, yeah, probably speak sort of once, a, once twice a week. Uh, depends when he calls me back. He's not great on the old calls or text messages getting back to me. Um, but yeah, we had a chat. He, he texted me this morning to see how I pulled up after the game. And um, yeah, hopefully I'll get down and, and watch a bit of his game to Sabo. Jared's coming on a little bit later. Spike? Yes. Yes, the woogie, yep. How often, <laughs> uh, yeah, woogie. How often did you guys speak during uh, the week? Was it rare? Yeah, Jared studies the game, as Bolts know, a fair bit, so uh, we'd speak about it a bit, and we still do now, um, obviously, with the way uh, the game's going and uh, uh, being in the media, you sort of want to be on the cutting edge of it all, but, uh, yeah, we used to speak regularly about it. Lethal, we've got the brothers on. Your yep. brother played a lot. We've just got a bit of a graphic. Yep. Yourself and Kelvin, almost 400, uh, 500 between you. Yep, Kelvin played about 100 for Hawthorne. We shared. We're both in the Premiership in 1976, which was a fantastic memory for both of us and the family. And then he went to Geelong to finish off those last 50-odd games of his... Uh, of his career. He actually had a really bad knee injury in the prime of his career back in the mid-70s when a bad knee injury then was really uh, yeah. disastrous. Yeah. 
Now, Jude, we haven't left you out. We understand Matt and Dominic are brothers, but we didn't see them playing a lot, so as close as we could get was someone who's not related. <laughs> <laughs> but I, to this day, I still have people saying, yeah. oh, your brother, brother finished up running recently, and I was like, no, we're not brothers. We're five months difference <laughs> apart. So they think we've played for a long time together. Now, what we've put together is there's 21 sets of brothers in the AFL. This is the older brother's side, which will take on the younger brothers. There's 43 yeah. brothers. Selwoods obviously have the three. Do you reckon the older brothers or the younger brothers win this? Extraordinary to think that so many brothers can be playing this elite yeah. game. Captain we're, trying, we're trying to lose a lot of information. Yeah, yeah, we've got to get you cut. Tell yeah. me, though, Lee, you were, I mean, yeah. as a younger brother, do you think your competitive juices oh, are fired up in the backyard trying you know, to beat which, up your well, older brother? Yeah, when you, when you look back on it, like <sighs> when you're... You know, when you're a little kid, when you're in your early teens, I mean, when we're your backyard sport, your sibling rivalry, I think that helps for your competitive yeah. juices. And just having the sort of the competitive playmate, yeah. in a way, in the backyard. You idolise the older brother, yeah. but you also want to beat him. And there's, uh, I don't know, it just brings <laughs> it out of you. Yeah, it is. But I think it's a great feeling when your younger brother does something that you think special. I think it's the best feeling you can possibly have outside having your own children. I think it's uh, a really nice feeling. We'll get to a great moment on the last Saturday in September with your brother Jude just a little bit later on. Uh, Jared in the show. Jude. Jude, this is your game. Lions and Eagles, a couple of brothers here. Beams and uh, Selwoods are on both lists. This so. was this was a huge contest up at the Gabba. I mean, uh, the, both teams were entering the game at two, uh, two and four, so we knew it was going to be a huge contest. I think. Uh, uh, West Coast got off to the great start at, um, early on. They structure up really well with Kennedy, Darling and Lacra up front. So, um, you know, Pritis and Selwood were doing the job through the midfield. But here's Mitch Golby. It took 27 games to get his first goal. And within a couple of minutes, he actually had two in the first quarter. So Lions looked like they, they were only scoring on the fast break a fair bit. But in the second quarter, they really dragged themselves back into the contest, lifted their contested ball rate and, and, uh, and really just made a real scrap. It was one of those days for, for the small forwards to really stand out. Uh, great contest here from Leuenberger, just one-on-one -on -one with Cox, just rolls one through. Uh, at at, at three-quarter time, it's all tied up, but um, here's Nat Newey, the human oh. highlight reel, just uh, getting up there. But um, just towards the back end of it, you could just see that uh, Brisbane just lacked a little bit of polish when it counted, and that was just an intercept. And uh, here's another one, the intercept here from Josh Hill, and just runs in, and this was the sealer. But uh, the three things I learnt, the, the Eagles are starting to harm. They had a uh, big win against West, uh, Western Bulldogs last week and then another solid win away. The Lions, they're a capable team, but uh, just lack that little bit of polish. I think uh, Simon Black started as the sub. Hopefully he'll be play a full game next week. And lastly, just Josh Kennedy is, uh, is suited to all conditions. Uh, we just felt that it was a, uh, a day for small forwards, but he was dribbling through on the left. He was, he was leading, he was marking strongly. And you look up the other end, it was uh, Jonathan Brown being well held by, by Eric McKenzie. So... It was just, uh, it was just one. Look at this one on the left. Just a, a really small forward type goal. So he's just suited to all conditions. You spoke about Jonathan Brown being well held. Yeah, Eric McKenzie just uh, kept him to, to, I think, about six possessions. So he was just all over him all day, and the crowd really roared in the in the third term when when finally Johnny Brown was able to push off him and uh, and actually get a lead up mark. So it was a really tough day for uh, for Jonathan Brown. Heard Daniel Wells start as a sub, but so too did Simon Black, yeah. one of the men influential well, he in hasn't, your... He hasn't played this year, and apparently he was a little bit ill uh, late in the week, so they decided to, to, to start him as sub. So I think it was a combination of having not played at all and the fact he was a little bit off-colour, they thought they'd, uh, they'd was, start him. It up. was business as usual for Simon Black, though. She comes comes on as sub, mm. straight into a contest, free kick at the stoppage, and then uh, you know a couple of clearances after that and a little goal as well out, out of the middle. So you know mm. he was, he was uh, back into it. Lethal, would you have started him as a sub? Well, I think the illness thing is the issue. I mean, he's not. He would. I mean, he'll start next week. But I, I'm just only knowing what I'm reading in the papers. But apparently, he was a little bit off colour, so that was the that was the reason. Tell me, uh, it was business as usual for Michael Voss post game, just answering questions about his future. People can talk about all those sorts of things and cast whatever they want, but I'm not here to save my job. I'm here to do my job. It's just that simple for me. As far as I'm aware, and what's been communicated to me from the board is that uh, that they'll be dealt with at the end of the year. Reasonably tough road ahead as well. Carlton, Collingwood and Geelong all up at the Gabba. Essendon, Fremantle and Hawthorne away. Andrew, when you see Michael Voss just getting peppered, what are you going to do after footy other than coach? <laughs> uh, oh, yeah, I'll have to wait and see. I'll probably go into some finance or something like that. Seems to be uh, have my weekends off. Um, but, yeah, I, like, I do have a bit of interest in it, but we'll sort of wait and see. And, um, you know, like, I think the, the thing I find hard as a player is, um, you know, you're constantly on, and, and I think the same as coaches. They're there just as long as, as what we are. 
um, and plus they're putting in hours and you know looking at tape and going over that. So yeah, I'll have to weigh it up once I finish. Um, but yeah, probably more look down the uh, the business sort of finance area. Will Vossi get renewed? Do you think lethal? It probably depends what happens this year. I mean, he's in his fifth year, and this is if if, if they can, if it continues on, then they don't play finals, only win seven or eight games, and therefore you haven't played finals for four years. It almost becomes a statistical reality that the club looks for a change. I mean, it's different to players. I mean, the coach is the representative of the team. If the team isn't winning enough games of footy after a certain period of time, unless there's enormous faith from the board in the individual coach, the numbers just get you. I had four years out of the finals and I sacked myself. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's true. I did. In 2008. So it's a very difficult decision because Bossy is so well regarded by everyone around the Brisbane Lions footy club. It's a very hard decision, but I mean, there was an article that said they're going to they're going to make a decision in round 15, which seems to be false according to the club. But clearly, at the end of the year, they've got to make that call. When it comes to August, well, that's when you start to think about those things. Lee, okay. do you find it hard watching Vossi go through that? He's such a great person. You coach him yeah. for a long time, captain yeah. of your club. You regard yeah. him as one of the best coach players you ever coach. Absolutely. Do you find it very hard to watch that? Well, I do, but I tell you, you know that it's the industry. I yeah, mean, yeah. if you choose coaching, you know that you're, uh, what the team does is a reflect... You know, or the, you, it's regarded as the team is reflective of the coach. And sometimes there is a great connection. Sometimes you just haven't got the talent to work with. But either way, the numbers it's eventually... Brutal if, you're in, if you're in the industry, that's what happens. Mm. Yeah. You're in the West next week. Out of 10, what are the chances that Andrew Swallow lines up? 10. <laughs> Take that, it's very low. Thank you for joining us. All right, thank you. Andrew Swallow, got a crook right knee. Great of him to join us this morning. Jared McVeigh still to join us and a feel good story from the grand final last year and all the news from Steve O. Stay with us. Well, I think our revenues have been hammered. I mean, there's not a lot of um, excitement for anybody to get involved with at the moment, is there? Tell us about your mum, why she shows so special. Because she's my mum. My mum. Because she's my mum. Because she's your mum. <laughs> Mums are a big part of footy. And today it's all about saying thanks, mum. So let's find out from our future stars in footy what they think about their mums. Tell me about footy and your mum. Does she help you have a kick? What, what does she do good at footy? Basically, she, yeah, basically she's a trainer, so 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 basically she helps us if we get injured, injured, injured. injuries. Yeah, I have no idea. I've never seen her play football. <laughs> Does your mum have a kick with you, a handball, a mark? Does she tackle you? No, not much. You might want to have a chat to mum about that. Work on your skills a bit. What are you going to get your mum on Mother's Day? Um, a pot plant. Oh, fantastic! What type of plant are you going to get her? Uh, just comes with the pot. No. <laughs> Plant in a pot. Make her breakfast in bed and get, make her a coffee. Hi, Mum. I'm going to give you a pot on Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day, Mum. Happy Mother's Day, Mum, and I hope you have a good one. Mum, you are the best person in the world and I love you. Again, happy Mother's Day to all the mothers that do so much for getting the footy uh, rolling for all these kids around Australia last uh, night, Fremantle Collingwood. Over in the West, the Dockers started on fire, first five. Got out to a 44-point lead. Would you believe the Pies hit the front early going in the last and then yeah. Spike, the Dockers got going again. Yeah, they did, and uh, it was a big game for the Pies. They really need to find some form, and uh, they'd been struggling in recent weeks. But Fremantle had set themselves, and they come out firing. Uh, Mundy sapping a nice goal there to get things started, and uh, they just looked the better side right from the very start. Uh, Walters there, outstanding player, clean below his knees, and able to dish off and also kick goals himself. Uh, an, an outstanding young player. But Collingwood rallied as we knew they would. Uh, the score there was uh, they were in a lot of trouble, but every time they got close or a run on Ballantyne or a, player up small forward would have a shot from the angle and put it through and just uh, put a dart right through Collingwood's heart and then in the third quarter we knew Collingwood would come back great side we understand that they have fantastic players they end up kicking five goals in a row and they took the lead at one stage there but in the end Fremantle were just too good they were strong at the ball Walters this is one of his four goals he was absolutely magnificent and uh, he's a player that's been in outstanding form Fremantle iced it in the end and won quite comfortably in the end and Collingwood have got 
some real worries, Hayne, but uh, three things that I learned that Ross Lyon is an absolute genius. Uh, his coaching is outstanding. In crunch moments, he's able to make the right moves at the right time. Luke Ball must put him in once he's fit. He's a very clean player. We know he wins contested possession. They really need some help in that area. And Michael Walters, four goals, all Australian form, 19 for the year. He's a player that I think has just gone in leaps and bounds and uh, outstanding player. And you can see some of his highlights here, boys. He, uh, his vision is fantastic. His goal sense is great. And his one-on-one -on -one bodywork, and we talk about the push rule, he really exposed it last night. He didn't use his hands, he used his, uh, his body, got the foot in front of his opponent, was able to push him out of the way with his hips and take some really crucial marks. It's amazing, isn't it? I mean, the way the, the push-up when the ball's in the opposition forward line has made it for these small forwards. When the ball quickly comes out, it's about, it's about speed. And the Walters and little Thomas, Lindsay Thomas, I mean, they just... But they're small. It's not pack marks, but they still just their speed gets them involved when the ball slingshots out of defence. It's a great part of our game, the electric small forwards at the yep. moment, isn't it? It is. We've got so many, and I think uh, Milne has been exceptional at it for yep. a long period of time, and I think he's underrated. You know, he's kicked over 500 goals, but uh, just to see a, a small player like that take marks in a one-on-one -on -one situation without using his hands was fantastic. And uh, we do so much work on our core and leg work, and that was just a real good example of how to do it. So from little Michael Walters to big John Griffin, uh, really disappointing to see this last night. Aaron Sandlands, Matthew Pavlich disappeared. And the right knee, we understand it's not been confirmed, but ACL, Jude, the worst kind. It's, ter yeah. it's terrible stuff. And it just puts him uh, in, under a lot of pressure now. I think uh, Jack Hannath had to go into the ruck and, yep. uh, and also Zach Dawson as well. And I, I guess that's a bit of the genius you were talking about with uh, Ross Lyon as well. Yeah, he, he's outstanding. I think at, some, at one stage there in the third quarter, he ushered away his coaches on the bench, as you can see here, and uh, he just made the moves himself. And uh, he put Dawson into the ruck, Walters into the midfield, and uh, just said, this is how we're going to play, boys. I've sat down. I've had a real good think about it. Don't worry about my assistance. And uh, if you play like this, uh, we'll go out and win the game. And it was a master move. How did they handle Scotty Pendlebury? Yeah, it was like a whole team performance, really, in the end. Every time he ran past the ball, it was a hip and shoulder. Uh, gang tackling was fantastic. I mean, we know he's fantastic at finding space, Jude, don't we? And uh, look at that. There's two, three players. Every time he got the ball, they just put pressure on him. And uh, that's what you need to do against the gun players. I know it's hard for them, but uh, when, if they've got time and they've got space, they'll hurt you, and they allowed him no time to dish off a handball or a kick. It shows you that you've got Crowley on him, who's just one of the best yep. taggers mm -hmm. in the game, but you do need that team, team defence and, and blokes helping him out all the time. Absolutely. Lethal, this is like something uh, from the 12th man. Listen carefully uh, to Hayden Ballantyne. <laughs> My ball up. Brent. Brent. He punched me in the nuts. Brent kicked. <laughs> well, it was, it was pretty clear what Hayden Ballantyne thought had happened, I guess. Uh, that'll, be, that'll be is there sufficient force rule. Well, I mean, obviously he sure has struck out a little bit, but if it's not sufficient force, then they tend to let it go. So Any force in that area is sufficient, isn't it? <laughs> Uh, well, that's true. You wouldn't want too much for us. But he, he, he was on his feet and he was uh, continuing to play on Hayden, Hayden Ballantyne. And Bucks, uh, he looked to be just a cranky individual last night. They'd got to a point where they were in control. This is... Uh I suppose this is the life they, of the they coach. They got about 40... What was it? 44 40, down. 44 down. So, I mean, that's when you think, gee, we're... Uh, this is a tough night at the office. It's just, uh, it just wasn't working for them early, even though they got themselves back in contention. And you see the Collingwood players' eyes... Everyone was looking at him. It's, you know, that's the respect that the, the guy has. He was, you know, we've seen other coaches at times when yep. you know, players might be a bit despondent, but every player was really intense and watching what Bucks and listening to what he was saying. He'll enjoy Luke Ball and Dane Beams back in that side. We'll enjoy Jared McVeigh. He joins us shortly. But right now, it's the Nick of Eight Round 7 speed wrap. A little bit too easily, Stevenson. Broadbent takes it. Broadbent, three in a row for the power. He's got to run at it. Oh, Paddy. He's got it. Big grab. Buddy sits over the top here. Buddy there as well. Buddy and Richards. Richards and Buddy. Buddy just bought through. One, two. Bang! Buddy's got three. Things up for Dawson initially. Now Sutcliffe. He backs himself from 70 and lets the ball roll and roll and roll. The dogs, I can sense this is their moment. Oh, Jones! Huge lead, but he's been painted. Off the front. Lewenberger. Oh. It's a massive occasion with a big, big build-up. As we start this game then, back in from the side, Goddard. 
Held on too slightly, but got our take the map. The better, Johnson gets it arrived. He's a strong champ. Hawkins goes back, but he's got one here. But well, that's a beauty. And a good oh, one. Good How about that? And he'll run on, and the bombers get a break. There's a wave of bombers across the ground, and this man can kick a long way. There goes Hibbert's kick, and it's home. And Duncan, normally a good kick, and Geelong get the one they needed. Big uh, leap comes from Lonigan. That's a pro, and he doesn't let his team down. Crash. And stop through for a goal. They just can't buy one at the moment. Half chance in the pocket, oh. and that's all he needs. Oh, oh. Bell Chambers, let Stokes through. Oh, there's a killer, a haymaker. Schmitz lines up and kicks a goal. And Geelong oh. win the battle of the undefeated. At the top of the table, Jem, under the Friday night lights. The full house sign was out and the Cats, they did it again. They trailed at one stage by just under four goals. High intensity, fabulous watching, but lethal, as they so often do, they got the job done. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it was a fantastic game where, you, I mean, very rarely do you get to round seven, you have two undefeated teams, so... I mean, that, that was the you thought of 2010, wasn't it, when he jumped in the grand final, in another jumper, of course, Brendan Goddard, but... I mean, it was a really close first half. Um, both sides really tough. They, Geelong lost, lost Taylor Hunt early with lot, what looks like maybe a crack collarbone. But the scoring tended to be coming from upfield players, not the uh, not the permanent forwards, but guys from upfield who would just sneak through the 50 metre line. Hibbard kicked a couple for Essendon. Uh, Myers kicked a couple. And and really, I, I think this was in the third quarter when really the game was won. Uh, Essendon kicked one goal nine, and Geelong kicked six goals two. That that was the break. I mean, there's, we see so many games, we can talk about a multitude of uh, statistical KPIs, but the ability to kick goals from shots, Geelong did it, Essendon didn't do it, Geelong won. It was basically almost as, uh, almost as simple as that as the way I saw the game, but a fantastic game of footy that eventually Essendon got home. Uh, sorry, Geelong got home. Yeah. Three things out of Three Friday night footy? Well, Essendon clearly won the clearances but lost the game. So you, if you're getting the clearances, you need the outside ball carry to be valuable. Geelong had a bit more of that, Motlop, uh, Christensen, etc. Gee, Essendon's tools, the uh, fact that they've got so many of them, is going to create a real selection dilemma. Because if young, Dana, young Joe Danaher is another young prodigy, he's a 200 centimetre, how are you going to play them all, I don't know. And Steve Johnson, Johnson's vision is extraordinary. You'd think he's got eyes in the back of his head. I must say, he does take the 1 out of 10 option, but pretty often the 1 out of 10 works. Uh, but he, uh, he had a terrific game. It looked like they were, Geelong were trying to get him as the direct matchup for Joe Watson and just they both played their game who would be the most valuable and as it turned out on the night Steve Johnson had one of his absolute blinders and an honourable mention to Boris Enright who gave that handball yeah, over the top hands. went 35 metres yeah. vision was two extraordinary two great disposals though 25 metre handball that set up the fantastic inside kick Pods uh, was moved yeah. into the back line. Lonigan went forward. Really good move. Gee, that's been helpful. Well, Lonigan only drifted into the forward. I don't think he was ever a permanent forward. But twice he took marks in the goal square. So Geelong have clearly got some kind of system where someone, like might even be the Ruckman, will cover. But Pods, the Adley, he actually went back and played as a permanent defender at different parts of the game. So, uh, so that's a, a great attribute, I think, for Geelong that uh, Pods, the Adley, gives him another tall defensive uh, option. They're flexible, aren't they? How does a bloke with one kidney, Jude, do this? This is just mm. incredible to footage. Uh, running back with the flight once again, just puts himself in that position. It's it's just phenomenal. Yeah. I can't I can't fathom how he does that. It's I wonder, uh, it crosses his mind at that moment, at that split second. Well, geez, you know the ball's going to go overhead. There might be someone come for mine. I wonder if it even just crosses his mind. I guess, I guess it's just the expectation of your teammates. Yeah. I think, and, I think uh, he said jokingly afterwards, "Fine, that's the side where there's no kidney." <laughs> <laughs> So he wasn't wrong. Tell me, Motlop, Smets uh, and Jackson Thurlow, first gamer. He's been here forever, hasn't he? Yeah, they just keep uh, reproducing uh, young players, don't they? And they seem to uh, come into the side and adhere to what Geelong have set the standard for for so long. And uh, they come in, they do the hard things. Their team defence is outstanding. They know that if they can defend the ground well, it makes it easier for their team to uh, attack. And uh, they just come in and do everything right. It's all about the uh, easy option. Um, you know, I think... Just the way they've set up their club allows their young players to come in and say, hey, this is what we need to do to become a great side. Or if you want to play senior footy at Geelong, this is what you need to Absolutely. do. Absolutely. There's some fundamentals mm. that Geelong have as well as just aggressive through the ball, uh, through the middle. So they really back their skills. And, and the young guys just love it. I think Motlop especially, there's something always happens on the back of his, mm. uh, yeah. his play. He's got huge confidence at the moment, uh, <laughs> Mr Motlop. Tell me, David Hill 
disappeared to France, and Paddy Ryder was a surprise omission. Yeah. Lethal, if you could ask for a couple of weeks off in the middle of the year, which month would you choose? And I where would you I'd go? I'd choose June. Okay. I'd go to Wimble Wimble England for Wimbledon. Uh, I'd like to go to Royal Ascot <laughs> races. That'd be nice. Uh, <laughs> British Open. I mean, geez, we'd be. You'd just be in a Beetha spike, would you? No, I'd be going uh, watching the World Surfing Tour. I'd go to Rio. It's on at the moment. You just say, Herdy, uh, any chance of having two weeks off? <laughs> it's quite remarkable, isn't it? Bit of, bit of sun on the, in the Greek islands for me. I think you just take it, take the June off. As, should as go into the footy system. They should have a, no footy in June. Yeah. <laughs> no, Collingwood, Collingwood of yesterday, you would yeah, enjoy that. Have a big, big break mid-season. <laughs> Tell me, Spike, uh, were you surprised Paddy Ryder didn't play on Friday night? I was a little, but uh, I know he'd missed the three weeks and uh, we are talking earlier about how once you miss uh, through suspension or injury, match simulation is quite heavy, so you, you do uh, train quite hard. But uh, So match fitness, I wouldn't have thought, would have been a big issue, but I felt I think they felt Gumbleton was going really well and deserved another opportunity. Uh, he would cover a bit of the ruck work if it went forward. So I think they'll bring him straight back in, though. Uh, his flexibility in the ruck and also forward. They could have used him down back at times, Paddy Ryder, I thought, too, at centre-half back. He has had an outstanding year at centre-half back uh, in previous years before so uh, a bit of a strange one but uh, the boys know what they're doing. Okay so Spike says Paddy Ryder straight back in we'll bring Jared McVeigh straight in in just a moment he's in the select forum just signing cards and a heartfelt story on the McVeigh's an unbelievable grand final story straight after the break. On the last Saturday in September last year, Lolita McVeigh was at the MCG with her mum Clementine to watch her dad, Jared, help the Swans to Premiership glory. She's the little angel that came down. And she's such a happy baby, smiles like all the time. Born 12 weeks before the grand final, Lolita was a godsend for her parents, who a year earlier lost baby Luella after a battle with a heart condition. I'm so happy for Jared. The gods have smiled. So, I knew, I knew they were going to win. Our little Luella's watching over us. This is unbelievable. After the year I've had, it doesn't get any better. She loved the grand final. She cheered for you the whole way. It's the first time your wife's cried at a football match and your baby's seen a grand final and a premiership. It's her first footy game of her life. And my, one of the best ever. <laughs> I can't believe it. I just can't believe it. An amazing story. Welcome to Jared McVeigh. Thank you for having me. Uh, I'm going to move on pretty quickly because I'm going to cry. Uh, grand final last year. I was going to show you some footage. Tell me what you feel and think when you see this. Oh, just the, you know, it's obviously such a tight game and the emotion when that sign rings is, you know, one you can't describe. Uh, relief. Um, Happiness and uh, yeah, look, one of the best or the best moment in my footy career. On behalf of Everest, what you've been through is staggering, and we will say congratulations on everything you've done. It's been amazing. Thank you. Spike, uh, as close as you get, I suppose, to winning a grand final as if your close brother does. Yeah, it's uh, it's quite amazing. Uh, I got there sort of ten years ago and lost to Lethal side uh, when they went on their run, but uh, that was a great moment uh, for my. You know, not only for our family, but just I retired on that day and to watch Jared uh, do so well, I was very, very proud of him. And uh, uh, he got the, uh, played on the biggest stage, he got the job done and uh, that's what we all strive to do and uh, I wasn't able to do it, but uh, I got a huge buzz out of it. Yeah, I think a lot of people did. Uh, last night, Hawthorne and Sydney at the MCG. The Hawks got the points last night after that wonderful grand final. Buddy found some form again. He kicked three after being goalless the previous two. Jared Roughhead was simply sensational. The man they call Gunstall, wearing number 19, he got three. Hodgie, enormous on the big stage. And sadly for the Swans, Jude, not a great night. No, it was a very disappointing night. I mean, uh, the fans of both sides are, were really looking forward to this game. I think uh, there's no bigger stage. But here's Buddy Franklin, obviously been held goalless for two weeks in a row and then kicks one in the first couple of minutes. So they were up and going early. They, they came out with a real intensity and uh, striking at the footy. And we just we didn't have any response. We uh, They sliced us up in terms of uncontested marks. and. 
Um, just our lack of our hit around the ball, I guess, as well. And uh, this was an incredible goal. It bounced over Josh Gibson's head twice and went through. But the, but the, the margin just blew out very early. I think they had uh, uh, Roughhead, Franklin and Gunston kicking three first half goals each. They kicked six straight in the second quarter. Um, and uh, this guy, Luke Hodge, was uh, phenomenal all night. He, he had 32 touches. But... Um, you know, we just we just battled. We left it to too few. Here's Joey Kennedy, uh, one of the one of the few was really pushing out, and uh, and also Adam Goods, who who, uh, who who played really well last night. But we didn't have a, enough winners on the ground over the over the whole journey, and uh, we just lacked composure on the on the big stage. And there's no bigger stage than than Saturday night footy at the G. Jude, would you, did you look at and Jude for that matter? Would you look at it that your offensive game didn't work, or your just defensive pressure that was un outstanding in the grand final wasn't quite as good last night? Yeah, look, our defensive pressure was off and, you know, probably those 50-50 balls we didn't win, uh, mm. which was, you know, really disappointing for us. And, and then, you know, when we did win those balls, our, you know, our entries into our forward line were, you know, terrible. You know, as, as, you know, I guess as bad as we've had all year and, um, and you know, that was, you know, the end result's a six-goal loss. Yeah, just, I guess, uh, the three things that I learned from last night, that just the Hawks came to play. They they were up and ready for the game, uh, as Macker said. And, um, and just it, uh, the, the second, I guess, is just that how much it does hurt. You're filthy to lose on the big stage. It just uh, it really burns in your stomach. Um, and also, Luke Hodge stood up again in a big game. I mean, he, he just floated across uh, half-back, went through the middle at times. Um, he's just got great ball use, and he just did what he pleased last night. He had 32 touches and kicked a goal. So, um, with just our lack of composure really cost us. Played into their hands by kicking it back to them, and then they they sliced us up on the way through. Now, was Jared just knew him, or were you playing on him, or you just knew him at that point, Jared? Uh, I think I was near him at that point. <laughs> 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 no, look, he's obviously a very good player and so smart around the ball when he's in defence. He's uh, you know organised the t you know his teammates and just sets up in great positions and and then has that counter attack for them. Jared, Jared yeah. Roughhead. Uh, in outstanding form uh, last night, uh, able to push forward, kick goals, and also he went into the midfield and had a real impact on the game. Yeah, look, he's a hard matchup in the midfield because he's so good around the ground, um, and obviously he's going to outmark anyone in the midfield. And then you know, big body, and then slides forward on on those midfields and kicks four goals, and you know, was in, in, in the end the difference. Tell us a little about Mike Pike. We saw a magic door yesterday, first Sudanese player to play. Now, Mike Pike's the first Canadian to have scored. A try in a World Cup and won a Premiership. It's an extraordinary story. Yeah, it is. Look, he's, um, you know, the story of his is, you know, very underestimated. And the work he puts in during the week, mm. as, as, you know, we've all seen, is, um, is, is unbelievable. He's willing to learn. He studies all the vision. He wants to improve. He does a lot of extras. And, and you know, it's no secret that he's becoming a good player now. He still calls the umpire the... The referees, uh, sideline, all those types of things. So he's still got to learn the lingo. All of us external people think Kurt Tippett's going to be available in the second half of the year and whether you can play Mumford and Pike. And I guess on that, who's first in now? Well, it's a, it's a really interesting one. I mean, we just love the way that uh, Kurt Tippett's really approached all his training in the, uh, mm. in the uh, background, I guess. He's been... It's a hard one to, to manage, I guess, mm. because he's, uh, he, he's so fit and ready to go, but you need to build him up for around 11 and 12, I guess. Jared, I'm going to steal a question from the audience. Sam Reid played uh, uh, loose man defence at times last night. He looked comfortable and uh, we know he can run really well. He moves across the ground great. Hasn't been in great form up forward. We know he's a great contested mark but hasn't been able to hold him. Is that a position that he may play uh, in the coming weeks? Yeah, look, he's played defence his whole junior career so right. he does know how to play there. Obviously, um, you know, he's been really good forward for us over the past few years and look, we were undersized uh, last night. They put Bailey in um, you know, Ruffhead and Franklin and Gunson up forward, so we're a bit undersized, and um, so we had to throw him back. And obviously, they had a good start, so we had to, you know, stop some of that run. Um, but look, it's nice to see him down forward and, you know, kicking some goals for us. From the brothers McVeigh to the Oracle Matthews, Lethal, I'm just going to show you last night, umpiring review system. Give us your mm. thoughts after you've heard this. Well, this was interesting. I mean, you've got to understand what. Just to explain what happened, the goal umpire thought it was a goal, but then a boundary umpire uh, thought it was touched. So then the field umpire takes control, and if there is confusion about whether it's a goal or behind, firstly, they go to the lower score, as a, as, and then they go to the video review. So in other words, they said, OK, they said to the video review people, we think it was touched, therefore a point. Now it goes to the video review. The video review was inconclusive, so that's why it was adjudicated as a, as a touched. So that was kind of the system working 
Unfortunately, there's a lot of commentators don't seem to know the system. It and that a, confuses everybody. It took a long time to play out because oh, the umpire, uh, the goal umpire, actually yeah. signaled goal as well. So they had to yeah. cancel that and go the other way. So. Yeah. How yeah. does the boundary umpire make a call like that when the post is in the way of his vision? Well, I mean, that's his opinion, obviously, whether it's a good opinion or not. But, I mean, basically, people often think the goal umpire is the sole, is the sole person. The field umpire is in control of the game. And if the goal umpire thinks it's a goal, the field umpire will say, yeah, I think it is, that's all clear. And if it's a behind, they go like that if you, want to, if you watch them. So ultimately, the field umpire takes control if someone other than the goal umpire is confused about what happened. And they, again, whether, you, whether it's right or wrong, they go to the lower decision. Now, that's a debatable point. Maybe you should go to goal umpire's call if there's a dispute. I was happy with it. It's a bit of a breather, isn't it? <laughs> it's a bit of a breather. It's <laughs> imperfect, the system, but would you prefer the imperfect system to no system? Um, I think they need a camera on the line, you know, a bit like the soccer. You know, I think they've brought in something like that. It needs to be but, right on the line, otherwise don't have it. OK. We're getting yelled at, least okay. we're going to go. Yep. <laughs> Time for a break. The McVeigh quiz coming up. And steve he's got all the latest news. Stay with us on Game Day. What is our core business? If anything, I, I don't think we've had enough focus on football over the last few years. I think as a club, we've, we've possibly tried to represent the club to be different, uh, bigger perhaps than it, it really is at this point in time. My club and the game mean so much to me. We preach honesty. We tell players to look in the mirror and be honest with yourself. In the hard times, your teammates are your brothers, your club supporters are like family, and your peers at other clubs are your friends. We must hold true to the same core values of honesty, hard work, fair play, and respect for others on and off the field. At our club, we're not just swans when we're wearing the red and white. I'm a swans player throughout my life in everything I do. Universally regarded as a brilliant season launch speech by the Premiership captain. Uh, how long did it take you to write that? Uh, look, I just did that on the spot, to be honest. <laughs> Off the cuff. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, look, you don't want to, you know, obviously a lot of people there and, you know, a big night for the AFL and, um, you know, you don't want to get those things wrong. So, uh, look, it does take a bit of time, but... I got through all right. Well, you got it absolutely right. Uh, Richmond got it right yesterday too in Adelaide. Port Adelaide versus Richmond at Amy Stadium. Really quick start to the Tigers without their skipper, without uh, Tyrone Vickery and Dylan Grimes. Jack Revolt kicked four in the first half, one in the second half, five goals, one. Jakey King was good with three. Martin and Deledio really good, but Spike Port never really in the hunt. Yeah, Hayne, we covered this uh, with seven and uh, we're all looking forward to the game. We felt that uh, both sides uh, potentially could play finals football at the end of the year and uh, Port had really struggled with their starts and once again yesterday they uh, got pants in the first quarter eight goals to two and uh, that man there Jack Rewalt that was one of his three goals in the first quarter certainly turned it on and got hold of young Jonas but uh, as we knew over the last couple of weeks Port Adelaide had been able to fight back and uh, try and put some scored ball pressure on in the second quarter they did that they come out and tackled and hunted the ball they were getting exposed uh, with the outnumber around the contest but every time they got close Richmond were able to uh, find an easy goal which uh, certainly took the shine off Port Adelaide's hard, hard work but uh, as the game went on there was a couple of nice goals uh, they never ever looked like they were in danger Richmond uh, Jakey King kicking another nice goal who was uh, really good up forward Richmond's kicking efficiency ran at about 79 per cent so they were quite outstanding I thought Port Adelaide were sitting back on their heels and not really pushing up at all and uh, allowed a lot of free men through the midfield. But the three things that I learnt that Richmond is a better side with Shane Tuck in it. He uh, certainly is a very good player. Unfortunately, he hurt his shoulder and we hope that he's OK. Hartlett's been tagged over the last couple of weeks and has really struggled with um, that tag and uh, he needs to work through that. He's a good enough player to do that and that'll take some time. And Deledio, he's an outstanding step-in captain. Uh, he really stood up with uh, plenty of possessions, kicked some really nice goals, really led from the front and uh, being there live, you could really see that he asked a lot from his team and uh, he was outstanding. His run and carry has always been exceptional and uh, he really uh, stepped in for Trent uh, remarkably well. Jack Rewald, he's uh, obviously copped a bit of undue criticism, I reckon, yeah. through the media. He had a pretty good response from him. Yeah, he did. Uh, he had Jonas, who uh, was out-positioned a lot. Uh, I think he tried to play him a number of different ways, and uh, that, that really got him started there. He cut off a real easy kick, but um, he didn't know, really know how to play him, that young player, and he tried really hard all day. This was a nice goal, really hard, as we know, left foot from there to kick, and uh, he just nailed it. Uh, he was up and about early and got him, got him going. 
The only low light couple of injuries, Shane Tuck, you've mentioned Chris Knights, who played his 100th last week and mm. seemed to be fitting in. Shane Tuck got clipped on, on the left wing and went back out onto the ground, then had to take on uh, Jared Rennan, which was stupid. He got punched again and got worse. And in the end, he was just sort of sitting in a forward pocket, then late on the pie. But Chris <laughs> yeah. Knights... They'll be showing that on Monday, though. Like Look at this. Looks just right. get out on the ground and do something. Else. No, I'm done. I'm done yeah. for the afternoon. This was terrible. Chris oh, Knights kicking yeah. a goal by himself. Just a dislocated knee, we understand. And it's like we got on the plane, he was seat, sitting in seat 1A, the splint on that right leg, yeah. and uh, behind mm. him, Shane, Shane Tuck with the collarbone, and then behind him, Jack Revolt just talking about his five and taking yeah. a straw poll as to which the plane <laughs> was his best five. So, yeah. all about Jack. We could tell straight away the deformity of the knee that something was up. He's, he's, a, he's worked really hard to get back into the side, and uh, he was in great form in 2008 with the Crows and then had all those injuries. And, uh, yeah, really disappointing for him. He seemed upbeat on the plane, as you are as an AFL footballer. You can only look to the future in your rehab, and you've got to get through it quick, but uh, hopefully speedy recovery. And uh, speaking of rehab, great to see Nathan Foley. He was a sub. He came on for Chris Knight. It's great to see. Nathan Foley back. We welcome Mark Stevens. Welcome to you, Steve. Hammer. How are you? Well, very good. What has always going on around the place? You caught up with Peter Jackson during the week. Yeah, you talk about splints and people being in damage. I mean, there's a lot of people hurting at Melbourne at the moment, and Peter Jackson's in for six months, and I caught up with him on Friday, brutally honest about where they're at at the moment. We thought that when Cameron Schwab was in that financially things were pretty good. This is what Peter Jackson had to say about exactly where they're at at the moment. Oh, financially we're going to have an operating loss of a million dollars this year and there's going to be some other one-off and abnormals on top of that so it's pointing significantly more than a million. Are we talking 1.5 million? Oh, maybe a bit north of that. So when you talk about tightening, is that cost cutting across the board? Is it uh, staff cuts? Well, I mean, if, if, you're going to, if you're going to rely on the current revenues and you're losing a million dollars on an operating basis, there's only one other thing you can change. Um, so we're going to have to look at that. and. You know, I've been open uh, with the staff about that. That's reality. They know that. Is the footy department, has that a chance to suffer as well? There's been a lot of money injected uh, into that. Well, the good thing about footy is that we are spending the money over there. Um, I'm not sure we're spending, spending it entirely in the right places, but we're spending enough. And, and by not the right places, what I mean is the structure, I think, is there's too many people coming through to the CEO, in my view, and we need to tighten that up and uh, get, get some more focus in the footy department. There's been a lot of talk about how the job came about. Did Andrew Dimitri just tap you on the shoulder? Oh, I wouldn't say I was tapped on the shoulder. I mean, Andrew Dimitri rang me because he knew that Melbourne wanted to... They, my understanding is they asked him, who do, you, who do you think might be available? And he suggested my name, but rang me to check first whether that was all right. Been around footy a long time. You've seen the pressure on Mark Neal. Has it been fair? Well, I think in the... Con certainly, I mean, the, the, the team's lost games and sometimes lost miserably. Um, members and supporters, I mean, they're frustrated and, and rightly so. Uh, this, this is not going to be about turning on a light switch. So in that sense, and all the external factors that have gone on in this footy club over the last 20 months, of which Mark, for a good part of that, has been right in the middle of it. As I say, I deny anyone to be, you know, performing at their optimum while that's all going on around them. So I just think we've got to give everyone a chance to, to prove what they can do. Can you see yourself moving into this full time? If you had asked me six weeks ago, I would have said you were mad if I'd be sitting here today. Um, so, look, you, obviously you never say never about anything. Look, I think he will be there full time. You can just see mm. it, it, the fire's burning there. And Mark knows uh, Peter Jackson very well. He's a cold, clinical type of person. And I don't think he's going to get the job done in six months. I think he'll be there for quite a while. What's yeah. the answer to the question of who runs their footy department currently? Hey, well, what, what name would you say? Well, Josh Marnie is the football manager. Also, Neil Craig's the experienced one in, at the head of footy. And clearly, he wants to know who's in charge mm. and, and cut back the lines of communication. He was affectionately known as Mr Burns when he was at Essendon <laughs> from The Simpsons. <laughs> Ruthless, <laughs> a bit grumpy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Six days in, he's got a good handle on the club. Uh, what about Essendon and Steve? Yeah, he's probably relieved he's not at Essendon at the moment. There's a lot going on there. Of course, players are now being interviewed. Shane Charter, the biochemist, has become involved. Two days of interviews from him this week and another one next week. I'd like to ask Spike, I mean, have you been interviewed yet or is it to come? No, I haven't been interviewed, but it's been indicated when it'll be and that's in the coming months, so... Uh understand that. I don't know uh, the ins and outs or uh, what players have been interviewed, whether it's been the leadership group first. Um, you know, that we have to respect the investigation. So I'll go in and I'll tell the truth 
and no, uh, and no need to hold back on anything and uh, be open and honest and uh, hopefully let's get this out of the way so the Bombers can concentrate on the season. Do you get much of a heads up on what's to come? Is there any paperwork that comes your way is, just as a guide? Yeah, there's a little bit of a guide uh, through that because none of us have been through this process before, uh, certainly on, on the legal part of it. So, uh, yeah, there's a bit of a heads up there. We're getting a lot of information. The club's been open and honest. The AFLPA has been outstanding, so couldn't ask for anything more. Could this play out for the Bombers through a final series, perhaps, if it it's drags out? It's looking like it. Um, I think uh, the fact that they haven't really interviewed everyone yet um, and there's so much uh, water to go under the bridge uh, you'd have to think that it takes some time a careful process um, we'd all like it to go away in the positive manner but um, I still stick to my guns and believe James heard on face value about well, how he spoke in the media he's a fantastic person and uh, truly believe that what he's saying is correct and you don't fear for your own health or whatever happened last no. year no. long term no you feeling better in 2013 for whatever you did in 2012? <laughs> you know what? If I took something in 2012, it didn't work because I was injured all year. <laughs> Hope you kept your receipts, Spike. <laughs> yeah. Time for a break. The McVeigh quiz coming up in just a moment. Mark and Jared go head to head as well as sounds good, sounds bad. Great servants of their football club, brothers, so it's time for the McVeigh quiz. Two questions each. Jude Bolton is the mediator. Last question goes to Jude. Time starts now. Jude, who is the better mark between Jared and I? Oh, I'd have to say you, Spikey. Yeah, you've been good overhead. Yep. Jude, who's the better kick? Yeah, actually, I'll uh, give your younger brother a bit of a rap. Yeah, Jared's the better kick there, definitely. Uh, who's the better surfer? Oh, sorry, Jared's. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> mate, I know he's, he's way better than you. Uh, who spent the most time in front of the mirror? Oh, well, uh, you've got no hair anymore. So he's, <laughs> and he's now in the media, so that's him. <laughs> all right, so that's two all. Two piece. All right, let's go to the decider. Let's go to the tie break. Cast your mind back. Who was the uh, biggest ladies' man back in the day? <laughs> Jesus. Now we're getting interesting questions. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Oh. No. I don't know either. Jim. Oh, really? You hope yeah. Someone's got to make a decision. If you walked into a single bar in? and there's one single lady at the bar and you walked in together, who would feel more confident walking out with a phone number? Well, he's pretty confident in himself. So, <laughs> <laughs> so you're handing him the victory? Um, he's probably got game like Dan Hanabry, which is not much. So. <laughs> <laughs> we'll call it a tie. Yeah, Lee, what about you and Kelvin? When you walked into a singles <laughs> bar, you were married at about 12, so... Yeah, we were pretty young. Well, Calvin, uh, we're similar size and shape when kids grow up. We were talking about it off air a little bit. When your brothers, you know, your background rivalry and all that kind of stuff, but, yeah, my little brother Kelvin wasn't so little. We were similar size and shape when we were growing up. And, yeah, this, this would be the 76 grand final. He's number four in the Hawthorne Guernsey there. That's, that's uh, Kelvin. He was one bloke I wouldn't have wanted to run into. He's about the same size as me, but he was... Uh, same genetics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah great memories. Time for sounds good, sounds bad. This uh, first one for you, Lethal. Balls that hit the post and go through for a yeah. goal should be a goal. Sounds good? Well, yeah, I'm leaning a bit that way. Only because we've got such massive coverage, TV coverage now. We've got the video review system. And clearly the balls that graze the post, you can't tell really. And I just wonder whether if you, if you either can maintain the controversy that exists now or if you want to remove the controversy, if they hit the post and go through the goals, they're a goal. So there's no, there is no controversy. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I think, it's a, I think it's an interesting debate. I've got to say, Sounds I, I might to lean that way, but I'm not sure whether I'm, uh, I'm, I'm totally, totally sold on the idea, but I think it is worth asking the question. OK, mm. sounds goodish and sounds bad. Did you, Jared, uh, Monday Night Football every week, sounds good or bad? Uh, bad. I don't like it every week, but obviously there's um, you know, a few games throughout the, the year that can be played on Monday, but I don't like it. Marking contest, Jude, should remain physical. Sounds good? Sounds good. Yeah. Happy? Yeah. Absolutely. Israel Flowers found his right sport, Spike? Uh, he's been outstanding for uh, the Waratahs, and I think so. Um, 
footy didn't suit him, AFL, but uh, he, uh, <laughs> he, uh, he, outstanding league player and uh, I think he's, he's scoring regularly. Uh, we see him, don't we, in Sydney a lot uh, and he's a big figure, and, uh, but he's been in outstanding form for the Waratahs and you'd think that he'd uh, get a Wallabies jumper this year. Okay, yeah. time for quick hands. I know we're running out of time, but we do have time for quick hands. Go for it. You're in charge or vice versa? Are you in charge of quick hands? I don't think I am. Hey, are you Is in Jared charge? Jared might be in charge. Am I in charge? <laughs> yeah. Who's in charge of these? Of quick hand, the quick hands, we don't know. No. Right. Got, um, Jared, OK, here we go. Hey, well, is it true? Is it true? <laughs> going to run now. Is it true? Here we go. Is it true when you were a young kid, you had a little blue blanket, and what you'd do, you'd let the corner of the blanket tickle the inside of your palm to make yourself fall asleep? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe when I was under one. <laughs> Jared, now, seeing she's a lucky omen, you won the grand final with your daughter at the footy, does she come every week now? Or no, not? She's only actually been to last week's game, which was my 200th, so that's it. Well, you won. So, so she's been a lucky two games. omen. Yeah, she's lucky. <laughs> is, it, uh, is it true that... Uh, the head circumference, my head is smaller than yours. <laughs> <laughs> that is total untrue. Uh, when Mark was actually young, he used to have the buttons sewed into the sides to get his head into jumpers. <laughs> <laughs> um, is it true when you were ordering eggs one time that you, <laughs> that you ordered eggs any style? So you read what was on the menu, but you didn't say what it was. Untrue. Oh, oh, hang on, hang on. Dude, dude, dude. I know that's and, and last, And last one, how long did you used to take you to eat your dinner and your veggies? You were up there for two hours after we'd all finished, weren't you? Still takes me a long time now. <laughs> just, yeah, just enjoying the food. Oh, well done, mate. Good on you. <laughs> I'll have eggs any style. Thank you. Let's have a look at what's happening on that. Uh, Surprise me. The tab.com.au websites, the Crows short, short, short. Melbourne, well, they've been uh, surpassed for favouritism against the Suns and St Kilda. Long price against the Blues on Monday night football. Check your local guides, but Giants and Adelaide for New South Wales and South Australia viewers. Monday night football as well, remember. Melbourne Gold Coast this afternoon, that is, if you're in Queensland. Jared, thank you very much for coming in. Appreciate it. Good luck. Thank you. Dude, always nice to see you. Thanks, Aaron. Well done, Spike. You know you're in charge of quick hands, then. You lost yeah, your quick no, hands. I just threw it out here to put a bit of pressure on. <laughs> Lethal, thank Thanks, you for Aaron. your time. Hope you enjoyed uh, the weekend. And again, to all the mothers out there, happy Mother's Day to Sylvan, to Soph, and all the mothers that do so much. Next Sunday, 10am, it's another big one up Cameron Lane. Sunday footy and Monday footy on 7. Bye for now.